Thank you. Uh, talk about the Grand Challenge Canada. What is it? How did it begin? Well, Grand Challenges actually started more than 100 years ago with David Hilbert. Grand Challenges in mathematics kept mathematicians going for 100 years. Unfortunately, that time frame is a bit too long for some of the global challenges we face today. In 2003, Bill Gates announced at Davos uh, Grand Challenges in Global Health, which was really a watershed moment in global health because it brought discovery science and this challenge-based thinking to the field of global health. And then uh, other countries got on board in uh, 2008. Canada announced it would use some of its uh, foreign development assistance for Grand Challenges approach to global health and development. 2010, USAID launched its Grand Challenges in Development. And the surprise has been other countries have now um, been doing the same. India, China, Brazil, Peru, Israel, Thailand, Ethiopia, and an African regional platform and others. So um, Grand Challenges have caught on. Not quite like TEDx, but um, they've caught on this approach. The, the Grand Challenge approach really has three core elements. You've got a defined challenge that you're trying to solve. You've got some clear metrics and accountability by which you'll measure your progress against the challenge overall, say over a 10-year time frame, and you do it through partnerships. So Those is saving elements. brains, is that the grand challenge at this yeah, point? Yeah, so a number of grand challenges have been launched um, in global health, but also in agriculture, in governance, uh, by grand challenges partners. And, um, and many things uh, look like grand challenges, talk like grand challenges, but are just called like that. Some things are called big bets and so on. But um, in the area of maternal newborn child health, uh, the initial challenge that was launched by uh, USAID and other partners, us, Gates, Norway, Korea, DFID, UK, was called Saving Lives at Birth. That is a $100 million challenge to save the lives of women and children in the day or two around the time of birth. When and unfortunately is, that a, is that a mixture of global dollars, WHO dollars? private dollars. So in the case of saving lives at birth, it's a mixture of the dollars of the six partners I've mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, initially it was five, and so we each contribute equally, and it's based on inputs. On saving brains, the thinking was that, um, you know, survival is obviously critical, but what parents care about even more is that their children should reach their full potential. And so uh, we launched the Saving Brains Challenge to tackle that issue of the one in three children around the world, that's 200 million children, who fail to reach their full potential. That means that the GDPs of economies are lower, the wages of those families are lower, and actually the social fabric is torn because um, some of the threats to kids' brains in the first thousand days of life leads to increased violence and increased non-communicable disease. So, that's why we launched the Saving Brains Challenge. It's a way actually to help people, families, and countries break the cycle of poverty. And many partners have now joined us, including Gates Foundation, a Brazilian foundation, Grand Challenge Ethiopia, a couple large NGOs, World Vision, Aga Khan Foundation of Canada, um, Bernard Van Leer Foundation that specializes in this, uh, UBS Optimist Foundation, and others. So the nature of a Grand Challenge is a number of partners work together. In the, in the Saving Brains case, we started off not by saying, let's each write an equal size check. We started off by saying, what problem are we trying to solve? How can each of us contribute to solving the problem? So for example, Bernard Van Leer Foundation is an expert in communications and advocacy, and that's what they bring to the project. These large NGOs are already operating at scale on very large scale platforms. Um, uh, Grand Challenge Canada has supported a pipeline of innovation, so the best of those can then transition to the large-scale implementation platforms. Gates Foundation very focused on issues of measurement in their I was going to ask you about that. What are the measurements? Well, um, the best measurements actually are direct measures of child development. Uh, and these are actually measures of executive functioning because what we know is the threats to kids' brains in the first thousand days of life um, don't really affect intelligence or IQ per se. They affect executive functioning, which is almost like the air traffic control center in your brain mm -hmm. that lets you multitask, that gives you judgment, um, that lets you attend to tasks. So you can see why if those are the capabilities that you lose, um, that's why your wages are lower, your violence levels are higher, et cetera. And there are direct measures of those uh, that people have developed. Um, what the Gates Foundation is doing is seeing whether any of the modern imaging tools, for example, uh, can also be used to uh, 
uh, measure executive functioning in young children. And this, of course, brings us to the Sustainable Development Goals, which for the first time have really focused on the issue of children thriving. And the indicators under those goals are looking like they will be direct measures of child development. That's the best measure of the best measure of whether a child develops is a direct measure of child development. It's uh, it's not that complicated. What sort of political infrastructure, health structure do you need in a country to really make significant impacts? At the leadership levels, who has to be really involved in it to really make an impact change? Leadership matters a lot at all levels, in families, in the organizations that are supporting innovation, in the organizations that are innovating, uh, like this Child Health Institute, Research mm -hmm. Institute, for example, uh, at Stanford, um, and of course in the domestic government in low and middle income countries. So leadership matters a lot, a focus on children matters a lot. But then you get into the bureaucratic and administrative structures of government. And one of the real challenges uh, of the whole issue of child development and saving brains is it tends to fall between stools. The health people care about nutrition. The education people care about pre-K. It's siloed. It gets siloed, and yet, uh, you know, we need to focus on the child, the child's brain, the development of that brain in the first thousand days of life. Probably the adolescent or um, older woman who is the mother and her nutritional status, the father, etc., but mostly the child. And um, that doesn't fit well with governments. And, you know, I, I like to say it doesn't matter if you're well nourished if you're a child soldier in northern Uganda. Mm -hmm. We need to see, we need to be risk factor agnostic and actually focus on the dependent variable we care about and make sure the risk factors, the independent variables, are optimized. For example, if you're living in Brazil today, one of the main threats to the brain of your child is probably Zika, because the microcephaly that we know comes with Zika virus is probably the tip of the iceberg. I think Zika virus is an economic and social and public health emergency in countries like Brazil, because 20 years from now, 30 years from now, there's a reasonable chance that it'll have a drag on the GDP of those countries as it derogates the human capital, which we know is formed, or begins to be formed, uh, the foundation for which is formed in the first thousand days of life. So um, this challenge of child development, of saving brains, of thrival, different ways of talking about the same thing, is one of the grandest grand challenges in the world because it is what locks children, families, countries into poverty. We talk so much about inequality and social mobility. Well, the ladder, the first rung on the ladder of social mobility is what happens to a child's brain in the first thousand days of life from the time of conception about till the age of two. I was going to ask you, you know, you mentioned the siloed nature of structures, governments, institutions. How do you crack the eggs and make people understand that we do have to get beyond that, as you were just describing? Well, your first question uh, uh, earlier on actually is the answer to that. It's leadership. Uh, you know, bureaucracies respond to the visions of their leaders. And we need to elevate the role of children and especially what happens to young children and their brains in the first thousand days of life to be foremost, a foremost consideration of, uh, of, of, of political leaders. And then things follow nicely in administrative, uh, in administrative uh, bureaucracies. If we're looking, for example, at the segment of this problem that can be solved by the domestic government, uh, the role of government is not total. Uh, much of these, many of these interactions happen in the private sphere. Uh, families and communities have um, also huge opportunities and I think also responsibilities to safeguard and protect the well-being of uh, children in those families and communities. But government does have a role, an important role, and uh, the starting point for that role is the vision of the leader. And uh, I think, you know, I, I tell uh, folks um, uh, in domestic governments, you're interested in human capital development, you're interested in skills building, you're interested in creating entrepreneurs. Well, the first skills building, skills training program your government will support, but support starts at the time of conception. Because if you don't get that right, 
you are going up the down escalator in everything else you're doing after that in primary education in uh, vocational, post-secondary, and everything else. I, I wonder if you agree that, as, as many people have often said, that children in maternal health is sort of the stepchild, the orphan of social policy, and that they really don't have key lobbyists, constituency groups. There's no one really representing children, per se. You have huge organizations representing older people. You have, and I wonder if you concur with that, that that those who are advocates for children, maternal health, women? I think that there are some very effective advocates for children. Um, but I think that that advocacy could be stepped up. Uh, we're sitting here in, in Palo Alto in Silicon Valley where much new wealth is being created, where you see uh, new foundations being created. And um, I do think that the leadership of um, that segment of U.S. society, of, uh, of people who have contributed, who have created wealth, who are now putting that wealth into foundations, uh, I think those voices in terms of a real focus on children, child development, development of children around the world could actually be a very effective added voice. So, you know, in summary, I'm not agreeing that there's no effective advocacy. There's a lot of effective advocacy behind Head Start, behind Too Small to Fail, behind uh, domestic uh, programs for children. And there's a lot of people, and I bet many of them, who've contributed their whole lives to advocating for children and children of disadvantage in the United States um, and increasingly around the world. Uh, but that game could be stepped up because the level of advocacy is still not at the level of the challenge. This is one of the most fundamental challenges. What happens to a child's brain in the first thousand days of her life is one of the most fundamental things uh, that we need to attend to in the world because it directs the future of our societies. It directs uh, the future GDP, the future levels of violence, the future levels of non-communicable disease. It's so central to our futures that we really should be attending to it today. I was talking to President Carter recently about children's health and maternal health, and he said that he does not believe there's enough of connection between women's economic empowerment and the impact of that on children's health. So President Carter, first of all, is one of the greatest heroes in the world. And look at what he's done, um, you know, with his uh, very specific focus on disease eradication, Guinea disease elimination of guinea worm, a very focused situation. And that shows you what real leadership and real advocacy can do. Now, to his point, uh, maybe I'd respond to it this way. We're in a very low interest rate environment, uh, and growth is stifled. And if you ask yourself, well, how's that going to change? It's going to change from the greater participation of women in the workforce, as you said. It's going to change from the more effective participation of people who are today in the womb or young children, in the workforce in the future. Um, and it's going to change overall from us tackling, from the world, tackling the sustainable development goals. Uh, yesterday I was at the United Nations and I heard the Government Bank of England, Mark Carney, making exactly this point, which is there are many reasons to tackle the sustainable development goals, and many social reasons, many moral reasons. Uh, but he added another reason which was tackling those sustainable development goals, including clean energy and, and the child issues we're talking about, are actually the path to growth and getting us out of a low interest rate environment. So, um, so your point was around President Carter. He shows you what individual advocacy can do. Uh, and yes, a focus on sustainable development goals, a focus on children uh, and the other elements in the sustainable development goals are very much um, what an advocate like uh, someone here in Silicon Valley who's looking for a cause, looking for focus, very much something uh, that um, uh, such an individual could pick up. Because what are those folks looking to do? Those folks are looking to make a very significant and huge transformation in the world for the better. They've done it once through their businesses. They're looking to do it again through their philanthropy. It's not easy to do in low and middle income countries. It's, these things are not easy to do. They're not easy to do twice. And so uh, really a smart focus on some of these fundamental problems 
and maybe um, uh, looking to see where, where some of these problems have been de-risked effectively in earlier investments of 50 to 100 million dollars in grant challenges and how those are going um, would be I think a terrific focus for uh, advocacy but also um, the type of advocacy that comes with evidence, the type of advocacy that comes with scholarship, solutions, knowledge, and a focus really on end beneficiaries, and the type of advocacy, and that's why I like the um, uh, environment here in Silicon Valley, the type of advocacy that knows you'll fail along the way. Because you cannot innovate without failing, right. but you can't succeed without failing. Disruption. So you have to disrupt, you have to fail, you have to see, but you want to fail fast, early, and learn from it. And so um, I think there's a huge opportunity for some of the folks who've created new wealth here to get in on this uh, situation of the sustainable development goals, child health, because very much aligned with, I think, the, uh, what people's fundamental motivations are, make a real difference in the world. And, you know, just look at the difference Bill and Melinda Gates have made. They've made a huge difference in the world through their foundation, through their support of global health. Well, it, there is opportunity uh, for... Um, amplifying that kind of uh, that kind of difference, and much of that opportunity lives right here in Silicon Valley. Do you think there's a need for more disruption? In that you know that that NGOs and the like are on paths that they believe are getting them places and may not be getting them places as quickly. Yeah. There is definitely a need for disruption. I mean, in terms of NGOs, uh, I've actually become a fan of NGOs. I see how they're disrupting themselves. I see how they're struggling with issues of sustainability, and you know, the core issue is, uh, and NGOs are working in very difficult, very war-torn settings. Uh, some of these large organizations make a huge difference. They're very important partners of us, of, uh, uh, of children. Uh, so I have a lot of respect having watched and, and what are they struggling with? The issue of sustainability. You know, how do you go from a situation where you're actually creating sustainable change? That's hard for NGOs. It's hard for academics, it's hard for governments, it's hard for everybody. And we all need to come together to focus on that issue. Sustainability in some ways is harder than scale. And uh, that's where I think the creative, disruptive thinking of um, uh, philanthropists here in Silicon Valley could be hugely helpful on the SDGs in general, of course, and also on issues of child health and especially child thrival in the context of those uh, sustainable development goals. Great. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Appreciate Good. it. Appreciate it. Thank you.